Greetings. I hope and trust. I do find you all my dear friends. We want to roll over now from uh, employment law, which we have discussed in detail, and we're just going to consider consumer protection over two series or two videos of an hour each, hopefully. Let us look at uh, the background to consumer protection. What is consumer protection? This is the relationship between the seller and the buyer. Even as you go into the Bible, the Bible then says, you think you are rich, but buy of me wisdom. Christ speaks in this consumer language that seeks to make us appreciate that we are to purchase that which is salvific. We are to purchase that which is helpful for our redemption. And even as we look at Christ having paid the redemption, what is that? That is the consideration. That is the price. We have been bought with the price. As we go into consumer protection, I pray that the Lord will speak to us in ways that we can appreciate and understand what this study is all about. Let us spend a moment in prayer before we go on. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of calling upon your name. It's been a long day for some of us, but even as we go into your study, give us sharpness of mind, lucidity of mind, and above all, may you even address our consumer-related issues. Some of us, our cabinets are empty. We have not been to the shops in a while. I pray, dear Lord, that you may meet us at our various points of need. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. Without further ado, uh, on the background of this particular provision, consumer protection, you will notice that this is an act that is designed to ensure that the consumers are protected as far as goods and services are related. And this is by ensuring a fair, efficient and sustainable and transparent marketplace for consumers and business. As we go through this exercise, you will realize that actually the tilt is more towards the consumer and less towards the supplier because the, the balance has been skewed towards the supplier so the government comes in to skew it so that it, 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 it balances and it's even. But maybe in so doing, has the government actually skewed it too much towards this consumer? I'll leave you to judge as we go through these two uh, sessions. The first thing that you want to notice is that the objective of this act is to ensure that the transactions are fair. And what do you mean by fair? It means reasonable and just. Number two, they ought to be efficient. This whole transaction, this whole business um, interaction ought to be done efficiently. So the turnover and the lead times for the processes ought to be timeless. And number three, it ought to be sustainable. You remember us discovering this, I mean, discussing this in employment law, where we looked at that there ought to be economic sustainability. So we want to look at the issue of how does this particular act bring about sustainability. And lastly, transparency. We'll look at the duty of full disclosure as far as prices are concerned, as far as defects are concerned. These are some of the things that we're going to look at. Now, secondly, we want to look at to whom does the CPA 2019 apply? Number one, you're going to notice that it applies to the trade of goods and services that are transacted in Zimbabwe. And you'll find this in section number three, subsection one, and at paragraphs A up to C. So it, it does not matter, even if these particular goods that are being transacted over or the services that are being transacted over constitute part of a consignment of goods or services, even though some of these may be, may be situated or located beyond the borders. The fact that there are transactions that pertain to goods and services in Zimbabwe, therein, this act just takes a grip of that and it applies there. And uh, secondly, you're going to also notice that it applies to suppliers, irrespect of the supplier's residence or location of headquarters, where you're going to find this in section three, subsection three, and at paragraph A, and at paragraph B as well. At paragraph B, what you'll notice there is that 
You cannot have a situation whereby because the supplier has headquarters in South Africa or headquarters in Britain or Germany, then we're going to say this does not apply to that particular supplier. It doesn't work that way. And uh, secondly, this particular supplier on paragraph B, it matters less whether it is for a profit or it is set up as a non-profit organization. It will still apply to it as long as it deals in goods and services. CPA 2019 will apply. And then in paragraph C, you will learn that it matters less whether the supplier is a natural or juristic person. Secondly, whether this person is privately limited or publicly listed as an entity. We're going to cover this when we get into companies' law. And thirdly, it doesn't matter whether the enterprise is run by private citizens or it is state-owned and operated. And at D, number four, neither does it matter if the supplier is operating within the strict terms of the license of trade. So you cannot have an exemption based on that um, you were not registered at the time you supplied the goods. If you are ordinarily considered to supply these goods and you continually do so, you shall be considered for the sake of this act to be someone who has that particular provision to supply these things. And actually, the, the, cost, the, the customer is protected. We're going to discuss this in liability at the end of video number two, where the, the customer is um, given the assumption the leeway of assuming that the supplier is authorized to deal in the process that he handles himself, I mean, hands himself out to be um, conversant with. And thirdly, the inapplicability of the act. Where is this act inapplicable? Number one, it does not apply to where goods or services are supplied to the state. So it, it would appear as if... Uh, the, the, the state is exonerated. No, 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 not at all. Read it closely. What it simply means is that the state can never be a customer. So an individual can be a supplier of the state. Um, a juristic person can be a supplier of the state. But where you have supplied goods to the state, this particular act will not apply. So what it means is that the act um, will not come to the rescue of the state. And the reason is very simple because the state is the one that administers the laws anyway. And who would dare treat, I mean, cheat the state? And, uh, and, and you, there, there's no way we can have an imbalance where uh, someone is um, ideally supposed to uh, have a control over the state. This is where you talk about maybe um, the, the kind of setups where one would allege that the state has been captured or something like that. But ideally, under normal circumstances, the state has the highest and uh, strongest of power. And uh, thirdly, it does not apply to juristic persons against other juristic persons. And these juristic persons generally operate at the same level. But there can be an exception where there are some juristic persons who would be earning uh, below a certain threshold. So the minister is the one to define, I haven't had time to check on this, to say those who have a turnover of so much can be protected under this act. And the minister in this case being the Minister of Justice. And then uh, thirdly, you're going to find that it does not apply to employment contracts, where we've just come from. So if you have any service um, services that you're rendering by virtue of being an employee, the Consumer Price Act would not apply in that case. And you're going to find both these proceedings, the one for juristic persons at uh, subsection, I mean, section three, subsection two, and at paragraph B, while the one that uh, proscribes um, employment setup will be at paragraph C. And then lastly, it does not cover transactions over immovable property. So we're talking about land and fixtures that are on it. So you could be looking at rentals, you could be looking at purchase of, um, uh, what do you call that, purchase of uh, land. You cannot, you cannot have those covered under this provision. So in a nutshell, what have we looked at here? before we go into the rights. We have looked at the Consumer Price Act of 2019 and it is applicable and its objective is to ensure that the transactions are done fairly. Number two, they are supposed to be done efficiently. Thirdly, they are supposed to be sustainable. And number four, they're supposed to be transparent. And where does it apply? It would apply to goods and services 
that are transacted over within the country. Should you have part of these goods being within the country, it will still be applicable nonetheless. And secondly, it would also be applicable to suppliers irrespective of where they are headquartered. As long as the transaction is in Zimbabwe, it doesn't matter where you're headquartered. And thirdly, you also want to notice that it would apply to juristic persons only as they are gazetted by the minister. So if the minister says you are having a turnover that um, basically uh, leaves you in a situation where you can handle your own weight, the, this particular act would not apply to you. And then thirdly, it doesn't matter if the person who handle, um, who uh, presents themselves as a supplier is acting in keeping with their license or not. That is neither here nor there. However, it will not be applicable where you have um, uh, gone into operation with, uh, into a transaction with the state. So in essence, it will not protect the state. And then at B, for certain uh, entities that are proscribed by uh, gazetting by the minister. And lastly, it does not cover transactions under an employment contract or transactions over a movable contract. Now, let us look at the fundamental rights uh, that are protected. We said its objectives is to deliver on fairness and justice over issues that have to do with uh, sale. So when we look at the fundamental rights, what I found to be interesting here is that the CPA uses what we term contract language. So when you look at the fundamental rights, what we must understand is that a fundamental right ordinarily is not easily alienate, uh, alienated you'll need to have reasonable and justifiable grounds for you to limit this fundamental right. So as you go into the fundamental rights, you'll find, them, you'll find these at section 10 and subsection 2. That's the one we're going to discuss in detail. The rest of them, I'll leave them uh, for you to read in your spare time. Our focus for now is to look at the employees, um, listen to me, not the employees, look at the consumer's rights, the consumer's rights. And section 10, subsection 2 provides for right to fair value, good quality, and safety of goods and services. And particularly subsection 2 reads as follows. Every consumer has a right to receive goods or services that are safe, free from defects and hazards, and that A, are reasonably suitable for the purposes for which they are generally intended. B, will be usable and durable for a reasonable period of time, having regard to the use to which the goods would normally be put and to all the surrounding circumstances of their supply. And C, are free from defects. And D, are serviceable when necessary. And E, are of fair value. Now let us go on and analyze subsection 2 of section 10 in detail. Break it down you're going to find this is a packed, a packed right. If you just understand this, you're going to find that as a consumer, you're going to be way, way ahead of where you've been in the past. The first thing that we find is that this provision says we need to have safe and hazard-free goods. This is in terms of section 43. It provides as follows, in addition to subsection 1, if a provision or notice concerns any activity or facility that is subject to any risk, A, of an unusual character or nature, or B, the presence of which the consumer could not reasonably be expected to be aware of or notice, or which a consumer could not reasonably be expected to notice or contemplate in the circumstances, or C, that could result in serious injury or death, the supplier shall. Now let's look at what the supplier ought to do to ensure that this does not happen. We should always have safety as our number one priority. Number two, there should never be hazards as far as goods are concerned. Number one, the supplier should specifically draw the fact, nature, and potential effect of that risk to the attention of the consumer in a manner and form that satisfies the requirements of subsections three and four. And number two, the consumer shall have assented to that provision or notice by signing 
or initialing the provision or otherwise acting in a manner consistent with the acknowledgement of the notice, awareness of the risk and acceptance of that provision. And in pursuance of number two, listen to this. I'm now looking at um, uh, section 13 and subsection two. It says, you shall avail the original signed copy to the customer. So let me just go back before we, 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 we consider the rest of them so that we take them bit by bit. Now notice the first thing you must do, you must specifically draw, you must specifically draw the fact, nature or potential effect of that risk to the consumer in a manner or form that satisfies the requirements of subsection three. What is the first requirement of subsection three? That this must be written in a clear and intelligible language that they understand. And at number four, what is the other provision? The other provision is that the fact, nature, and effect of the provision or notice referred to in subsection one shall be drawn to the attention of the consumer in a conspicuous manner and form that is likely to attract the attention of the consumer. Having regard to the circumstances before the consumer enters into the transaction or agreement, begins to engage in the activity or enters or gains access to the facility. So what, what you find here is those kinds of setups where when you walk into a shop and usually you find these in, um, uh, let me not use a derogatory term, but in smaller enterprises, they'll have a sticker, a sticker right there by the teal that says no refunds or no exchanges. You, you'll get those kind of notices. We're going to look at this tomorrow. But in a nutshell, what they're trying to do is to ensure that they're giving you this notice uh, before you enter into the contract. Or even when you get to the, um, the bays where you leave your goods, they'll indicate that you're leaving the goods at your own risk. So what they're doing is to notify you before you even deposit your goods so that you know that you are assuming the full risk should you get there and find that your goods are nowhere to be found provided there has been no negligence, because ordinarily they will give you a card that you must then tender upon your return. But I've, I've seen something interesting. You find a scenario whereby they actually, uh, during those busy days, they'll slot a number of parcels into that counter or even put um, some goods next to it. And uh, that is quite risky, in my opinion, but, uh, and even negligent. But you would have assumed that, that that risk when you deposit your goods in those lockers and you leave them as you walk around town. But coming back to this, you need to then ensure that when you are going to uh, have that notice, you draw the attention of the customer to that notice. And number two, the consumer must then assent to that provision. So they must sign. And if they have not signed, they must signal at least to say they have assented to that particular provision. Otherwise, this is not going to be binding. And now if you go into section 13, section 13 then demands that you must furnish this person with the original copy where you have made them take on an undertaking that is risky. For example, maybe let's say you're going into some roller coaster ride. They, they, they would say you're going onto this thing at your own risk. Should you go there and, and the wheels come off? You have assumed the risk. It's risky. It might happen. You've had uh, scenarios where people are on some uh, lifts that are going over mountains and cables or fufu slides, and the cable snaps. When you write there, it's a risky enterprise. So you do get onto it at your own risk. That's, that's what it, it entails. So um, that besides, you want to also look at the next thing. The goods that are being serviced are supposed to be suitable for the purposes for which they have been ordered. So you could have a scenario where someone will comes over and says, I need goods of this quality, goods to do this particular kind of, uh, of thing for me. So when these are then um, procured from a supplier and the supplier gives the undertaking that he can uh, supply these goods, there is a need for them to meet certain requirements. And what do we find here? We find that if a consumer has specifically informed the supplier of the particular purpose for which the consumer wishes to acquire or supply or apply any goods or services and the supplier, according to subsection three, 
A ordinarily offers to supply such goods or services, or at B acts in a manner consistent with being knowledgeable about the use or provision of those goods or services, the consumer has a right to expect that they are reasonably suitable for the specific purpose that the consumer has indicated. So this is the assumption. They have a right to do so, and they're ordinarily protected. They have told you what they want, and you have given the impression that you can deliver. Now consider this. This must be read in juxtaposition with section 21, subsection 4, which provides as follows. Upon delivery of any goods or services, the supplier shall give the consumer an opportunity to examine the goods or services for the purpose of ascertaining whether he or she is satisfied that the goods or services are a of a type and quality contemplated in the agreement b in the case of a special order or agreement they conform to the material specifications of the special order so this is something that the supplier is ordinarily entitled to to make sure that the goods are fit for purpose. Should they not be fit for purpose, guess what? They have a right to return the goods, and we'll get to that shortly. Should they not be fit for purpose, they have a right to sue for damages. They have a, retire, a right to have them either replaced or even uh, claim for a refund. They, they, there is nothing you can do about that. And item number three that we're looking at still under section two, subsection two, I mean, usability and durability. And this is in the context of uh, 2B, which reads as follows. Will be usable and durable for a reasonable period of time, having regard to the use to which the goods would normally be put and to all the surrounding circumstances of their supply. So what happens here is you cannot sell something that is going to work for one day, work for two days and it packs. You sell something that is going to be used for two months and it packs. There are certain guarantees that are already implied to ensure that things that are bought, things that are sold, are going to deliver. So the Consumer Protection Act already puts in these warranties that are already implied. So the guarantee cannot come in uh, at less than these periods that are already provided for. And Section 11, Subsection 2, already provides for this. Subject to Subsection 1, Within six months after the delivery of any goods to a consumer, the consumer may return the goods to the supplier without penalty and at the supplier's risk and expense. If the goods fail to satisfy the requirements and standards contemplated in section 10, subsection 2, and the supplier at the direction of the consumer shall A, repair or replace the failed unsafe or defective goods, or B, refund the consumer the amount paid by the consumer for the goods. Now, let us pause here for a moment. Notice something. If these goods fail within six months, you have a right to take them back at the supplier's expense. And here's the other right that you have. The right is to direct whether you are going to go for replacement or for a repair. So this is what the law does, it gives the discretion of issuing the directive to the consumer, not to the protect, I mean to, to, to the supplier. So the supplier cannot be the one that says, oh, it, it has a defect, we'll, we'll repay it for you. You are the one who has the, 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 the honors to decide whether you want a, a repair or you want a replacement. This is in terms of section 11, subsection 2. And secondly, besides that, you may also call for a refund and simply say, give me my money back. I have no interest in dealing with you guys. You are not good for your word. Now, let's look at what uh, subsection 3 then provides for. If a supplier repairs any particular goods or any component of any such goods, and within three months, a further failure, defect, or unsafe feature is discovered, the supplier at his or her expense shall A, replace the goods, B, refund the consumer the amount paid by the consumer for the goods. Now, you're going to notice that this is now building up from the first encounter. Should you decide not to replace the goods and have them repaired, they have three months within which to ensure 
that this particular defect does not arise. And should it arise at that point, they now have two options. Replace with a new one or refund. It cannot be another repair because you'll keep repairing things and repairing things. The Consumer Act brings finality to that. It is either you get good goods. If they are defective in some way, let them be repaired if they're repairable and you have the stomach for it. Okay. And this must not go on forever. It must be defects should not arise within six months. And secondly, where there are any repairs, there must be no defects that should arise within the three months of the repair. And then number four, this one is the one that is more uh, broader. It must be free of defects. Now, the common law position had been where the customer inspects the goods um, for any patent defects. And patent defects are the kind of um, uh, defects that you would ordinarily recognize upon a cursory inspection. You don't necessarily have to be trained. You, you must notice I'm buying a chair, it must have four legs. There is no way I'm buying a chair that is not a tripod and it has three legs or it has two legs. So if, if you accepted it as it is, you, you could not then turn around and say at the point of delivery and you say, no, no, by the way, wh wh where are the other two chairs? You, you can't do that. You, you, it is a patent flaw that you should have recognized at the point of inspection. So you cannot turn around. Now, listen to what um, the, 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 this particular provision gives at uh, subsection number five. In applying subsection two, A, it is irrelevant whether Number one, a product failure or defect was latent or patent. And two, the defect could have been detected by a consumer before delivery of goods or services. Or B, a product failure or defect may not be inferred in respect of particular goods or services solely on the grounds that better goods or services have subsequently become available from the same or any other producer or supplier. Now, let us explain this in brief. The first part is that should you have a scenario where someone has not uh, inspected the goods and they then discover a patent failure within six months, you cannot turn around and say, this patent failure was there at the time of sale. You should have seen it. It is your responsibility as the supplier to disclose that there, there, there's this patent failure, there's this patent defect actually with the product and you must have the, 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 the customer sign and agree to accept the goods as they are. Without that, the customer is entitled to come back five months and 25 days into the agreement and say, I have observed a patent defect on this good, replace it. And you'll be obliged to replace it and avail the, the good that is of quality, the expected quality. And uh, secondly, the other thing that is also uh, highlighted here is that where you have a defect that could have been detected by a consumer before the delivery of the goods or services arising, it is going to be of no effect. But secondly, there is a, a provision that sort of limits or stops the consumer from um, claiming. Should you have a scenario where um, the supplier sells goods to you, but somehow maybe because of technological advancement, they begin to produce goods that are of a better brand, better variety than what you bought within the six months. You cannot come and compare goods that were there before and goods that have been produced three months down the line and say, mine is of inferior quality, replace it. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. It is binding as at that time. That's what you got, and uh, that's what you keep. And then in the event of a latent or patent defect, now recourse to subsection 11, um, I mean section 11, subsection 2. If the goods fail to satisfy the requirements and standards contemplated in section 10, subsection 2, listen to what it says, and the supplier at the direction of the consumer shall repair or replace the failed, unsafe, or defective goods. Now, as mentioned earlier, should you have these defects uh, arise? The recourse shall always be, you go back to, to section 10, subsection 2, the end of it, and the supplier at the direction of the consumer shall repair or replace the failed, unsafe, or defective goods. 
Now, there's an exception that would apply. The exception would apply to scenarios whereby one has purchased goods from an auction. Goods that are purchased from an auction are purchased as they are. You cannot come around and say they are defective. You purchase them in the condition and state they are. You cannot come back and claim. Now, let's move over to number five. This is the other guarantee of this fundamental right. Section 26 and subsection 4 provides as follows. A price is adequately displayed to a consumer where, in relation to any particular goods or services, a written indication of the price expressed in the currency being used by the country is A, annexed or fixed, B, published in relation to the goods. Section 26 ordinarily should be read along with uh, statutory instrument 127 of 2020, which mandates that goods ought to be charged in RTGS and USD value using the prevailing exchange rate. Therefore, an inflation of the RTGS price would not result in fair value, while a discount of the USD price would not result in fair value for the one who's purchasing on the RTGS value. So what uh, the fair pricing basically means is that goods must be worth their value. So unfortunately, um, if you have a scenario whereby the black market is the one that determines value, you now have a problem because the standard has, someone has run away with the standard. So we have a scenario where the, 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 the chief banker is trying to re-establish the standard, uh, re-enact the value. Now, in so doing, what is happening here is the, the RPZ is actually encroaching between, in this consumer agreement, the, the supplier is no longer at, um, it will, does no longer enjoy that leeway of deciding how much goods are going to be worth. So there must be a fair value and the pricing aspect, the currency ought to be a currency that is trading within the country. So it must appear there and uh, the exchange rate must be the applicable one. And then the, the second part, as far as fair value is concerned, there ought to be a publishing of the prices. The price must be annexed. It must be attached next to the product. Why should it be attached next to the product? Uh, this is a straightforward requirement because when we did part one, we said uh, an advert is ordinarily um, an invitation to treat. Now, the advert being an invitation to treat, what is the employer's... Um, why do you always keep going back to the employer? What is the cost customer's option? The customer's option is to pick up the goods from the shelf, walk over to the till, and when the customer presents the goods over, uh, at the till, that is now uh, an, an offer. So the employer, I mean the, the, the supplier, will then accept this particular offer for, for, for the goods in exchange for the consideration. That is the price that would have been uh, published or annexed to, to, to the product, next to the product. So in a scenario whereby you're now not going to get that price being annexed, then the invitation to treat becomes defective. Otherwise, what is the, 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 the customer offering? Because they cannot offer unless they know what the price is. So this is why there is a need for them to make that informed decision as far as the price is concerned. And uh, secondly, as far as the charges uh, like levies and taxes are concerned. So you cannot have a scenario whereby someone is going to give you a price and, and not factor in the VAT amount. Because when you get to the till, only to learn that there is VAT that should be added, at, at that point, it's too late for you to, to reconcile and say, uh -uh, this is not the offer that I want to make. So that information must always be available and it must be against the, 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 the goods that are being procured. And if you're getting a quotation, the quotation must indicate, they should not just give a quotation and say excluding VAT. It must be clear how much is the VAT, how much are the levers, and what is my total obligation to you. So these are things that ought to be covered therein. And then uh, you could have scenarios. These are things that happen many a times in our shops. Um, you get into a shop and you find that there's a price, there's a sticker that is given there. And uh, in spite of the sticker being there, uh, you get to the till and you're told, no, sorry, prices have been revised. The price that you saw on the shelf is the previous price, it's the old price. The new price is now so much, so now you need to pay this much. So in response to this, the Consumer Protection Act already takes into account some of these, these cases 
And according to subsection 5A, the supplier has an obligation to honor the price that is on the sticker. That is the price that would apply. And should you have a scenario where you have actually two prices where uh, someone has not been um, vigilant, usually what they do is uh, when they come with new prices, what I've seen is those shop attendants, they actually come and stick a price over. So should the initial price maybe fall off uh, and the price that remains on the, on the shelf is the price that will apply. Should they decide to stick it on the side and you have two prices, the law of the two is the one that will apply, and that is the law. And you're going to find this in subsection 5 at paragraph B. So these are some of the rights. The fundamental of these rights, they provide as follows. The fundamental, these ones you cannot take away before we go into any other rights. What do they provide for? Number one, you are going to be entitled to goods that are safe, goods that will not cause any harm to you, injury or result in death. This is a fundamental right. No one should be selling things that will cause harm. No one should be selling things that are not safe. And by things that are not safe, we're talking about uh, goods that are um, expired and they're being sold at half price. Those goods are not safe. There must be safe goods. That is the first thing that you must always know the law has uh, an obligation and it gives you that right. And secondly, besides being safe, they ought to be suitable, suitable for the purposes for which they are ordinarily designed for. So we cannot have a scenario where goods are being uh, pushed off and they do not meet the specif specifications. If they do not do so, the customers can return them within six months. If there are any repairs that have been done, they can still return them within three months. And they ought to be usable and durable for a reasonable time. So those are the six months and the three months. And they ought to be free from defects. And these defects, it does not matter whether you're just a supplier or you are just an importer or you are a producer. They must be free from defects. What they have to do is they will return them to the supplier who supplied, as long as there's a defect, it's, it's one thing for, to, for us to establish liability, but they will return them to the supplier, not necessarily to the producer, but always to the supplier. And they ought to be serviceable when necessary. And lastly, they ought to be of fair value. This is as far as the pricing is concerned. It ought to be fair. Now let's look at uh, the other rights that um, uh, customers also have. You're going to find these very interesting. The next um, right that we look at is the cooling off period. What is the cooling off period? Did you know that an em uh, a customer, even if I say employee next time, don't worry, I mean customer. Now, did you know that a customer can purchase goods and having purchased goods from your shop, they have five days, five business days. Anytime within those five business days, they can walk right back and say, please, could you have your goods back? Um, may I have my money? Provided, provided. These are not consumables. They're not going to be bringing back bread or pizza or cheese, having walked over with it to their house. They're not going to be bringing in um, goods, I mean like um, goods that uh, are, it is not healthy for us to even um, be sharing or even trying out, like clothes. Of course, I've seen stickers where some have said, uh, you, you can no longer return uh, clothes because of COVID-19, uh, that, that's something else. But for health reasons, there, there are some um, clothes that you buy and you know you cannot fit them um, and, and, and find out whether they are their perfect fit. Once you buy them, they're yours. No one else is going to be taking those. You, you know those clothes. Those ones you cannot bring back. And um, goods that you have not uh, destroyed, you, you have not uh, opened or broken the seal, but should they be still in a considerable good value within those five days, you can bring it back. And when you do so, you can not be uh, required to give a reason why you bring it back, and neither can you be penalized for doing so. The only thing that you can do when you do so, it shall be at your expense when you're bringing the goods back. You cannot do so at the supplier's expense. But you just bring them back. 
And this supplier should not ask questions or even seek to charge you for anything. Within 15 days, the supplier should return your money in full. Excluding the expenses for return because I'm sure you'll have driven there. You cannot claim for that. But upon receiving notice that you intend to rescind, 15 days from then, they must pay the money. If you have not given that notice, at least 15 days from the time the goods are returned, they must pay back the money. And that's the law in Zimbabwe, by the way. In Zimbabwe, is it an, appli an application? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it's an application. But as far as um, your reimbursement, you're entitled to it. And this is in terms of Section 34, uh, Paragraph 1A. Um, so we're going to look at that uh, shortly. Um, the other thing that you also notice, you'd, you could have scenarios where you have, um, by the way, transactions within Zimbabwe. So don't try this on Amazon or, or, or B&H. It will not work. Uh, or, or take a lot in South Africa and don't even think about that. So in, in the context of Zimbabwe, if you are transacting on uh, electronic um, uh, platforms, instead of the five days that would apply in the, cool, in the cooling off period where you have actually gone in person, you have seven days. For a transaction that has come through, seven days from there, you can decide to change your mind and say, I don't want it anymore. Uh, here are your goods, give me my refund. And here's the other comparison. It's seven days that side and it's 14 days for the cooling off period, if I'm not mistaken. So within 14 days, you ought to be refunded. Here's the other difference. If you've already prepaid, which would ordinarily be the case, we would not be looking at credit uh, purchases in Zimbabwe. Uh, we, we work on debit purchases. So if you would have prepaid, what would happen then is you are entitled to a full reimbursement, including the cost of returning the goods. I thought, my word, did we really just do that in Zimbabwe? You're going to charge the supplier for changing your mind? That's what the law says. And um, the other thing you're going to find now, let's move to section 34. This is the right to return goods. Uh, we're going to reference the, the cooling off periods that we have covered. And at section 34, this is what it says under the title consumer's right to return goods. Subsection 1 provides a consumer may return goods to the supplier and receive a full refund of the amount paid for the goods where the supplier has delivered. A. Consumer has rescinded an agreement during the cooling off period referred to in section 25, subsection 2, at the consumer's expense. This is the one I refer to, the five days. If you do so, this one is at your expense. And going further down, it would be at the supplier's expense. B, goods that were not expected before delivery and have been rejected in terms of section 21. Now, these goods that have not have been rejected in terms of section 21, it is goods that have not been accepted. We're going to cover this in the next video. But the issue is they ought to have been inspected and they were not inspected. Upon inspection, the, the consumer decide, discovers that either they're the wrong goods or they do not fit the purpose or they, there's a mix with other goods that ought not to be there. So you could have a scenario where all these are returned at your expense. And the D, within the seven days after delivery to the consumer, the goods have been found to be unsuitable for that particular purpose, and this is to be at the supplier's expense. So the seven days would apply for you to claim that they are not fit for purpose, and um, it could be on grounds that the goods have not been accepted. Now let's look at the other right that the customer has, an interesting one, uh, cancellation of advanced bookings. This one is in terms of section 20. And subsection 1 provides as follows, a consumer has the right to cancel any advance booking, reservation, or order for any goods or services to be supplied. Number 2, a supplier who makes a commitment or accepts a reservation to supply goods or services on a later date may A. Require a reasonable deposit. B. Charge a prescribed fee for the cancellation of the order or reservation. Skip three, go to number four. Now, number one, this particular person can require a deposit 
because people can make you do work and disappear. They never come back. So let them deposit so that you know that they'll definitely come back. And then they could also impose that should you cancel, I'm going to charge you for this. But uh, my primary interest is subsection 4, which provides as follows. A supplier may not charge any cancellation fee in respect of a booking, reservation, or order if the consumer is unable to honor the booking, reservation, or order because of death or hospitalization of A, the person to whom or for whose benefit the booking, reservation, or order was made. B, an immediate family member. Now, this one just blew me away. Just imagine you have a right not to be charged any cancellation fee should you be hospitalized or a member of your immediate family is hospitalized. Wife, husband, um, children, those would be immediate family. Or in the event of a death, so no one can charge you for cancellation. So cancellation ordinarily uh, is uh, something that you're going to give notice of, uh, I presume. You cannot cancel after the trip. So should you have a scenario where this occurs prior, because it's a pre-booking, by the way. So let, let, let's not get this mixed up, where you just don't pitch, and then two days down the line, you want to come and say, I'm here to cancel. Uh, that might be a bit of a challenge. You must actually give notice of the cancellation. So you, you may have problems there. So the cancellation fee would not then apply in that case. So what have we looked at here? These are um, some of the rights that an employ a, a, a customer has. And are, are these fair rights? I, I think uh, the customers have been flogged for far too long by the suppliers. And uh, the government has come in just to make sure it, it sanitizes. It sanitizes this whole thing. Because um, people have um, made purchases on the spare of the moment only to realize later on, I really didn't need this. Or, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know what got over me. People must be given that right to change their minds. You, you cannot say every shopping ex, um, I mean, uh, um, experience must be jumping off the cliff. People must be given that option to say, uh-uh, uh-uh, I've changed my mind. I, I don't want it anymore. That should not be a crime. People must make other decisions and commit themselves for life. But um, shopping, surely. Uh, so these agreements, are actually the government is coming in, parliament is coming in to say, take note whether people are, are doing so uh, in person or they're doing so transacting online. Uh, you could have even a, a scenario whereby uh, some of those uh, transactions, uh, you, you click and you do so in error. A and, and trying to cancel that thing is very difficult. The, 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 the transaction goes through, like instantly, you know. It actually takes longer for, for your goods to come back than it does for you to pay money. So when you have paid, surely you must be in a position to, to cancel for whatever reason, whether it was done in error or or you have just changed your mind, or you've discovered that what you wanted to replace, you no longer need to replace. Uh, whatever you were replacing has revived or has been repaired and it's working, or it wasn't even dead after all. So that is a cooling off period. You don't need to justify why you want to recant and, and, and you know abandon that course altogether. The law provides this particular provision. And then the other thing is, you, you generally have a right to, ref, to return goods. And you can return goods based on the cooling off period, or you can return them because they are defective, or, 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 or you can return them because they've been delivered to the wrong place. These are your rights. But uh, what I want to stress is even if you, you're looking at a situation where you have been misled, we're look, going to look at misrepresentation tomorrow um, in, in the next clip. So where you, there's been misrepresentation and you discover this thing is not fit for purpose and, and, and you want to take it back, you, you must appreciate that uh, in as much as the supplier has the duty of disclosure, it, it does not necessarily mean where goods are defective. You, you need to bother yourself on disclosure issues. If they're defective, that is a fundamental right. If it endangers your life, that is a fundamental right. 
If it could result in death, it is your fundamental right to just take it back. If it, if it doesn't work, people who go out and run businesses must produce quality. If it is not quality, take it back. If it doesn't meet the standards, you take it back and you ask for your money back. This is going to um, force the suppliers to operate at the qualities levels that they, 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 they present themselves to be able to deliver at. So this is something that the law provides for and it protects the rights of uh, the, um, the consumer. Because many times consumers are even afraid to go back. Some of us, we had scenarios whereby, you know, you had your, your, your dad go into town. You don't know that, but your dad goes into town and brings in the wrong shoe size. And, and you have to limp with that thing until, you know, you like a horse shoe of your own. You, you had to extend the shoe. They, they would not even think about taking it back. They were so afraid. You have a right to take it back and say, it is not fit for purpose. This is supposed to be my son's shoe. He's a size 10. And I gave him a size 9. Here's your receipt. Exchange it. Here's your receipt. Exchange the goods. So you, you should not necessarily have a scenario whereby people are forced to do that. When you make mistakes, go back and cancel. Go back and change. And then the other item that you, you have a right to, to, to change is besides returning the goods, the, the right to cancel. You know, people have been told you cannot cancel. You're going to lose everything. You're going to forfeit everything. And if you're rebooking, uh, you can only carry over maybe half or a third from, from, from what you had. And these are not situations where you, you just slapped, you know, overslapped and uh, you could not catch the bus or catch the train or, or catch the plane. So some people have suffered bereavements. And when you go there for a rebooking, uh, those beautiful ladies will just tell you, sorry, it's company policy. We, we, we do not um, give a, a total cover for a rebook. Uh, we could not give anyone your, your seat. Well, what did you expect the person to do when they have lost a loved one? Surely, they should be able to cancel that. They should be able to cancel that. So my good friends, let us just take a pause here and leave it on uh, the consumer side. Uh, let this one chill a bit. And when we come back, we'll be looking at consumer protection, but this time from the supplier side. There are certain obligations that the supplier has to cover. These have been the rights of the consumers and I hope it's going to help you the next time you are shopping and uh, you find that uh, prices are being revised while you're at the till. You're going to be saying, please, honor the previous uh, price. If you think I'm, uh, I'm joking, check out your CPA 2019. You must give fair pricing and you must honor the previous price. Until we meet again, may God bless you. May he prosper you. Blessings and peace.